started, um, Jake, I'll let you take this away. Jake is our moderator today. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Again, you are muted and your cameras are off. Please submit all questions in the Q&A feature and we will address them at the end. Take it away, Jake. Great stuff, lovely. Thank you, Sonia. And thanks uh, to Bill Green for uh, hosting and having us along. Um, okay, we've got two uh, companies here talking about what they do. We've got um, Anthony Mishmet from Dwell Developments and Norm DeRosias from TC Legend Homes. Uh, let's just dive in. Um, Anthony from Dwell Development, why don't you tell us a bit about Dwell Development and what it is you do? Great, well, well thanks for having me. Um, so I started Dwell Development in 2005 and I had left my family business that was building homes, uh, townhomes, and, townhomes and single family homes in the city of Seattle. And I left because I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to be, uh, you know, a, a little fish in a big pond. Uh, trying to compete with a lot of people who are building homes and selling the city of Seattle. So I took the very first Bill Green, one of the very first Bill Green certification programs back in the early 2000s and felt that this was going to be a pathway forward for me to go out on my own and kind of start something different. And so I knew Bill Green and building sustainable homes was going to be the backbone of what I wanted to do, but I also wanted to shift and make the modern aesthetic more part of, of the dialogue, what I want to put out there. Nobody was doing modern construction, modern design back in, in 2003, 2004, 2005. So I wanted to differentiate myself. And when we started building our homes, uh, the goal was always to always lead, always challenge and always strive to do more with each home we build and try to learn from the previous one and how to build a better, more sustainable home. And thank goodness we did that because when the big housing market crashed, um, we were set up pretty well. I mean, my company grew by 300% during the downturn. We were pre-selling homes in foundation and people basically validated our model of not just design, because you got to get people to get out of the car to want to come into your home to begin with, but really they were willing and wanting to live in a sustainable, healthy home. And um, so the Bill Green program that I based my, my, whole, my whole company on uh, is a big part of everything we do. And uh, we <clears throat> went down the path of building passive homes and try to push the envelope. And we realize that people don't really understand what a passive home is and how it works, but they understand net zero energy. And so we shifted and started making all of our homes net zero energy ready for net zero energy. And it's been a quite a journey since then. Uh, it's 2021 now, I've built over 300 homes and um, a good handful of them have solar panel on them. All of them are net zero energy ready Five Star Bill Green, Emerald Star, International Living Institute, uh, Department of Energy award winning home. So, you know, we continue to kind of push the envelope on everything that we do and uh, we strive to, to learn on these projects. That's great stuff. Uh, thanks very much, Anthony. Same question to Norm, really. Uh, Norm, TC Legend Homes, uh, how many houses are you building? What kind of houses are they? Where are they? And really, anything else you want to tell us about your background? Sure. Um, yeah, so I jumped on with TC uh, about five years ago, um, and that was after kind of a long uh, process of, you know, growing up in a off-grid home and then uh, kind of taking some of the, some of the little elements that uh, we were living with um, that way to, to some of the construction practices that I was doing and built my first off-grid home and realized how little energy we were using and how easy it was really to do um, and started trying to integrate that into, you know, the houses that we were building uh, for other people. Uh, always fun to be the your own guinea pig and we did plenty of that and I, I still am in the house that I live in now. But, uh, you know, I, I, I went on this journey and I, I actually ran into uh, a couple of friends of mine who had started TC um, and uh, yeah five years ago we we set up a team and uh, we have now every home that we build which is you know probably you know four to five a year um, they're all custom homes but they're all uh, built green five star zero energy homes and um, it's, it's going really well. We, uh, have a huge demand and 
we're still getting calls from, you know, all over the country to, to help out with, um, you know, people like you guys here that um, are trying to do the same thing. So, yeah, happy to help. Great stuff, Norm. Thanks very much. All right, let's just go back to Anthony. Um, what I'd like you to do, Anthony, is just really describe your building system. So if you could just describe the house, it's a, you know, your typical dual development house is a high performance house, perhaps start the foundation, go up. How do you build it? How does it achieve this high level of performance? Uh, okay, absolutely. So the, the visual concept I want to put out to everybody is, is that think about filling a balloon with, with, with helium, right? You want that helium to stay in the balloon. If you have a not a very good balloon, it, the, the helium leaks out of it and, and, and the balloon will drop down. If you have a, a, a nicer balloon, then, then that helium stays in it longer. So the, the idea I'm trying to paint here is that when we build homes at Dwell, it's all about the thermal envelope of the house, making it really, really efficient. And it's built off of the passive house model, like I mentioned earlier. So we don't build passive houses anymore, but Everything we do, we say powered by passive house, the concept of passive house, making a house airtight, making it with high performance windows and insulation. So, you know, you want to keep all that energy inside the house and your mechanical loads come down. So to your question, Jake, you know, it all starts at, at the foundation, right? So we insulate four inches of, of rigid insulation underneath our slabs because, you know, one of the biggest ways you lose heat, heat loss in a house is right through the ground, right underneath the bottom of the crawl space or through the slab if it's not insulated. The, this, the next thing we do is once we frame the house up, we do a double two by four wall system. And the reason we chose that is because I'm a spec builder, I'm not a, I'm not a custom builder. So everything we do has to be price conscious and we have to get the most bang for our buck. And so from a, from a structural standpoint, a two by four wall works great. The reason why people use two by six or two by eight is because the code requires more insulation in the wall. So what we've decided to do is stick with the two by four construction and then just add an additional uh, furred out wall, an additional two by four wall that we can adjust that width. We can go eight inches, 10 inches, 12 inches, and we can pack that wall full of insulation depending on what, you know, what, what metrics we're trying to meet with our energy monitoring. So it gives us lots of flexibility. It gives us those chase lines to get mechanicals up to places where you couldn't normally get it uh, in a standard home. Then the roof. A lot of people put roofs on, they vent the roofs, it's a natural thing to do. Well, that's the, like the most place where most heat and energy loss shoots right out of the roof, the roof systems of homes. So, you know, we do a non-vented roof system and that non-vented roof system is, is critical to building a high performance home. And so we do either a truss or joist system on the roof, it depends on our design, and that underneath is packed with cellulose insulation. So you have no gaps in, in, in bib insulation, I mean, in um, bad insulation. So, but on top of the roof, we do another three inches of foam and a hardboard. So it helps with, you know, thermal loss, uh, moisture getting in there. And it makes that our roofs are anywhere from 60 to 90, you know, as far as their, their R values. So they're excessive. We've done 110 R value on one roof. So really you can't do too much. The key is you got to have it designed right. So, so there's no gaps. It has to be packed really, really tight. Um, and then really the critical thing is air sealing. And we've all built homes before where you go around and you try to, you know, tape up the holes and not have seams in, in between your framing members or the pink studs in the corners. And how do you get to all these little nooks and crannies, you know, a plumber drills a hole, oh, wrong spot, drill another hole in your in the side of your house and, and those are all heat loss areas and, and what we do is we put a fluid applied membrane around the whole exterior of our building all the sheet uh, the house is all sheeted ready to go roofs on and we roll this product called enviro dry onto the house and it is a fluid applied membrane that makes the house airtight waterproof so we can keep constructing during during the, the rainy winters around here and it flashes in the windows and it really air seals the house because it's much easier to air seal from a flat surface where you can see all the seams than it is to try to go find all the nooks and crannies on the inside of the house. So that is crucial. That, that element goes on the home, the roof is on, the windows are in, and we're dried in. We're proceeding with construction. Then on the interior, we do an additional air sealing technique called aero barrier. And it is a wonderful product. I know um, Norm and those guys use it as well. It's won all kinds of awards, but it, it takes all the guesswork out of making sure your house is airtight. And it's a system where there's airborne cough that goes into the air and it flies around as the house is pressurized and it air seals the house 
it gives that extra layer of protection. It goes where all those little nooks and crannies are and it builds up on top of each other until you get the ACH where you want it. it you can start off at a 2.5 or a five, and by the time you're done, you're down at zero or below. So it's an incredible product that is a key to what we do here at, at Dwell Development. Once you have that, then it's really about adding high performance triple pane windows into our, you wanna have all that solar gain to come in. You wanna keep that gain, but you don't wanna lose all the heat that, that, that's going out, out those windows and not those openings. So triple pane high performance windows are crucially important. And so now you have an airtight shell, you have high performance doors and windows, everything's staying inside. And the biggest thing you gotta add at this point is ventilation, right? Because if you don't ventilate it right, it ain't gonna work. So we install heat recovery ventilators in our homes. And these, these are a heat exchange process that's constantly bringing fresh air into the house and exporting that warm air that we've already paid for, that we've already heated. And instead of just dumping it and bringing in cold air, there's a heat exchange process that goes on. And it's very efficient. So it preheats all that cold air outside really efficiently. So your thermostat doesn't kick on. And so you have a big blanket around the house, massive amounts of insulation, no heat going out the roof or the bottom, your air, air system's moving the air around, and guess what? Your mechanical loads go whoop, way down. So your heating and cooling systems that you put in the house are minimal. And, and so you can do different types of heat pumps and um, uh, hot water heat pumps, and, and uh, we do mini splits. So if you can get that, that, that envelope tight and ventilate it right, you are right there. It's the key to everything that we do as well as in, in devils in the details for sure. Got it. Thank you very much, Ashley. And you do, um, I mean, you, you, you place solar panels on the roof on, on some houses and not on others, presumably? Every home we do is, is ready for solar panels. We have a net, net meter system already designed to go on it. Sometimes we put the solar panels on. Sometimes we let our homeowners put them on. Sometimes they put them on a year after they move in. So every home we every home we build is ready for solar, but we do it uh, on a few homes. Yeah. Great, and it's worth noting for attendees that the brands that Anthony and Norman indeed as well are using for windows and for the air sealing technologies are all listed. There is a handout at the end that basically will tell you which companies Anthony and, and Norma using tried and tested. So that's a handout. I think you request it or it, it comes up in the PowerPoint, but it's available. Um, thank you, Anthony. Norm, same question for you, really. I mean, the TC Legend builds houses. They have an envelope. Do you want to do the same routine? Start maybe from the bottom, go up to the top, tell us your envelope and your mechanical systems. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so, yep, same exact concept that Anthony just... Um, gave everybody. Uh, we have an envelope that starts from the ground up with um, ICF forms. So they're a foam form. If you guys aren't familiar, um, the ones that we are using are the new Duras and they, they have about a R24 value. Website claims some kind of strange thermal R value of an R50. Not exactly sure how that works. But and this is stem, stem wall insulation you're talking about here. Yep, this is the stem wall, and then um, we'll backfill the inside of our, our walls with, uh, you know, our sand and aggregate, and then uh, we put four inches of foam underneath our slabs. 99% um, of the homes that we build are slab on grade. It's a great way to seal up that floor space and make sure you never have to crawl into a crawl space ever again. Um, from there up, we... Uh, we use SIPS panels for our walls and roof system. Um, you know, you can specify different sizes uh, depending, I guess, on your climate around here. We've got can you just, your can you just standard. Describe, no, could you describe what a SIPS panel is? Because it's sure. Heavy. Yeah, um, there's there's a handful of different types, but the one that we use has a double skin um, and then a styrofoam or polystyrene you know, um, sandwich in the middle. And so uh, the ones that we use in this climate have five and a half inches of foam in the middle uh, between the two OSB skins on the outside. And then it makes it pretty easy to infill all your edges and your window buckouts with a standard two by six. Um, then the, the roof system um, is a, typically, uh, you know, it's, You'll, you'll infill with a two by 10. So you've got, you know, nine and a half 
inches of foam in this in the roof system. Um, our walls are ending up at about a R29, and then the roof system with that 10 inches more like a 45 to 48. You know, it fluctuates with the temperature, kind of an interesting little phenomenon with this polystyrene. Um, you know, the R value goes up with, uh, as the temperatures go down. Um, so yeah, that, that creates our completely sealed, um, you know, envelope uh, along with our triple pane high performance windows as well, um, everywhere. And, um, then we, you know, finish it off with, you know, super air sealing. Uh, I think Anthony did a great job of describing the aero barrier. We use that. And with SIPS panels, you have pretty minimal um, seams uh, through the walls. Uh, we glue all of the panels together with a mastic that's provided by uh, Premier, the SIPS panel company. Um, and then on top of that, we'll go through oftentimes with this tape it's the stickiest tape that I've ever come across and uh, it sticks to OSB like crazy. Um, so we'll tape those seams and then we'll top it all off with the aero barrier. Um, and then you can, you can watch your air exchanges just drop on um, the computer screen that the, that aero barrier comes out with. Um, yeah, and then we, we also use um, heat uh, or HRVs, heat recovery units. Um, you know, to preheat uh, the incoming fresh air to all of our living spaces. And uh, then we use heat pumps, you know, I mean, we're, we're using a quarter of the power, uh, you know, necessary to heat a conventional house. So, you know, these little heat pumps will do a lot or do everything that you need. Uh, we use a couple of different types of heat pumps, depending on the size of the house and whether or not, you know, our homeowners want, um, you know, radiant in floor heat. Um, that's going to be an air to water system where we, you know, and then we, for smaller homes, we can get away with, you know, mini splits or air to air. So it's a pretty simple process and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's working for us. Uh, I think I would pull you back to solar panels again. Uh, I mean, you're installing solar in TC legend. Yeah, we, we put solar panels on all the homes. Uh, we make sure that the panel sized to uh, power the house, all of the house loads, and then enough in excess to power at least one electric car. So. Sounds good, which would be net positive. Now, uh, let's just cycle around again. I realized I dropped the ball. Uh, we were going to talk, we're going to ask both Anthony and Norm to throw out some costs, perhaps, sort of in terms of, you know, what this stuff actually costs. And I, I know that Sonia's got a slide. I was wondering, and let's just roll back around again. Let's go back to Anthony. I mean, yeah. because you've got, this is an upgrade. Your building technology is different to, you know, code built minimum, code minimum or standard house. So what does yeah. it actually cost? above standard in your estimation and i know you've never built a normal house in your life <laughs> why don't you talk, talk about that for a while would you please well yeah you're, you're putting it to me because i've never built a, a code built home and, you know a lot of the builders in, 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 this, in this webinar you know we, we've all been taught code is like code's great you know especially in the northwest we're pretty progressive and, and, and code is the minimum requirement to get a permit so you know we look at code as as the bare minimum it's like congratulations you got a d minus on your report card there you go you know so what we do and what tc legend does is we want to get we want to get 100 percent better than that and that's that's net zero and, and the techniques that we do at dwell that we have done tried and true 50 different wall systems and in in and different kind of coordinations and everything is, is trying to get to a place where we can build these homes cost effectively and it's really important because if if nobody can afford to build it, nobody can afford to buy them, then no one's going to do them. And so we've tried to figure out the secret sauce of finding how do you get the best performance for the, for the best price. And what, what TC Legend and what Dwell does is all these things are really the goal is to get the house so it's using less energy in order to offset it with the solar. So the solar is the end game, but you got to get the building there cost effectively in order to get your, so your solar isn't a, $60,000 solar system. You want to be down in the, you know, the 15 to $30,000 range to get your so house. You build a super high performance house so you don't yeah. need a huge heating load. That's yeah. super comfortable. I mean, every home we build, we're at 
50 to 60%, sometimes 70% above code before solar. So if you're in that range, you know, before you break around, you have a healthy home that's comfortable, that's net zero energy ready. And now to, to get it there, you know, is, is the labor and is where the secret sauce is. And then the solar takes you to the promised land. And so you want to get the house to be able to perform. So you don't need all the solar to get any house can be net zero if you have an unlimited budget for solar. So I, I think it's, I want to make sure people understand that. But what we've done is that, and, and this is, you know, these are, this is very, very general because like I said, I've never built a code built home before, but you know, this is kind of what, you know, my conversations, me running numbers and kind of doing some pluses and minuses, but you know, uh, let's start with our, with our scenario, the building strategy of, of framing the double two by four wall. You know, when I send this to bid to my framer, you know, he sees the double two by four wall and he just says, okay, I can build that for you. No problem. Some other framer goes, hey, that's a little more labor intensive. I might, I'm going to add a little more money into the budget. That's why it could be from a labor standpoint, really no difference in your cost per square foot. It's just additional two by four labor, I mean, materials. So I put zero to $4,000 in there for labor and material, depending on your relationship with your supplier and the design of your homes and your, um, and your labor. Um, the non-vented roof assembly, uh, you know, it's, you know it, it is more for a roofer to come out uh, to, to do our roof systems. There's, there's more to it. There's more details to it. So that adds about four to $6,000 onto a standard roofing system, no matter if you're doing a flat roof, a TPO, or if you're doing a, you know, a retab, uh, you know, shingle roof, wh whatever you're doing, this, we have a system to get there. And it's anywhere from four to $6,000 on top of that. Um, the fluid applied uh, weatherproof barrier, uh, the Enviro Dry is what we call it. So, you know, these two, these next two items kind of go hand in hand because yeah, there's a cost, you know, to have someone come out and roll on that material, it's it depending on how big the house is, it's 3,500 to $5,000. But what you're eliminating in that cost is the fact that your ciders then don't have to go around and wrap your house with house paper to protect that, you know, to protect the building because because the Enviro Drive becomes part of your building envelope. It's attached to it, so there's no need to put a house paper on. So that usually deducts, you know, at least 2,500, if not more, off of your siding bid because you're not paying someone to go around and wrap and, and take that house like that because it's already done. It's already flashed. It's already waterproof. And, and so you've got it, air ceiling and you've got a vapor barrier in the same yes, package. Exactly. Right. So the one product's doing two jobs. So you can take one of those products yeah. off. The, and there's off a few the different floor. products out there. Again, we've tried them on. We, we built the passive house with, with a viral drive, which is very cost effective. And we built the passive house, Net Zero Energy Home with, with like Prosoco, which is like three or four times the price of, of, of the product we use. So it's really about the application and, and get the details in. Um, going to your window packages, you know, everybody uses, you know, in, in, in production build, well, I wouldn't call it a production builder, but in infill single family townhouses in the city of Seattle is where we build, you know, there's a few uh, different window manufacturers, but everybody offers a double pane or a triple pane window. And so um, we got upgrading to a triple pane window for your average package costs another four to 5,000 bucks, depending on how many windows you get in, in, in your home. Um, Adding the uh, the rigid insulation underneath uh, your slab, you know, my my concrete guy comes in, they buy the material, they have the labor come out and do it. And it's about three thousand dollars, but again, the impact for that three thousand dollars is, is massive on on the performance of the home. Um, air air sealing with that air barrier, that's the material that goes inside the house that you spray around and it kind of kind of locks everything down for us. The average house about four thousand bucks on top of it. Um, Heat recovery ventilator, you know, a lot of, I mean, very few builders. I mean, I think TC Legend is the only other builder I know that really puts in heat recovery ventilators, and it's going to be something that's pretty much going to be required. <laughs> Air sealing and heat recovery ventilators are going to be in every home here pretty soon when the, when the energy code changes. Well, I'm sure we'll talk more about that, but, you know, heat recovery ventilation in fully installed and ducted, you know, five to $7,000. I, I put on the high side here uh, for some of you guys to, to see the numbers. And then, um, when you do a heat recovery ventilator, then you don't have to do all the bath fans because it's actually exporting that stale air from your laundry room and your bathrooms. So it's pulling that air, air out. So you don't have that cost of, of bath fans throughout the house, you know, so that does a little deduction about 1500 bucks. So, you know, for us to be a, to build a net zero energy ready home, it's about four to 6% of our, of, of our standard construction budget. And it's not a lot. I mean, a lot of banks require you to put five to 10% and a lot of them for contingencies or unknowns. So, you know, to get your home to be extremely healthy, comfortable, balanced, you know, 
I don't think that's a huge investment, especially when you know people are willing to pay for it and they want it. And it's the right way to build a house, right? That's what people want to live in a healthy home, especially now. And heat recovery ventilators are a huge part of that because they clean and help filter that air when it comes in from our summer smoke, as well as, you know, COVID items going into the air and get people sick. So, you know, you can upgrade filters in these, in these systems as well. So that's a huge marketing aspect of all this as well. So to get it to net zero, it's just really the cost of the solar. It's like, how many of these steps did you do? And how many of them did you do them effectively with detail in mind? And a solar package could be anywhere from $15,000 to $30,000 on, on, you know, big single family home. And you'll get to net zero. And uh, really, that's, that's our goal and our mission is to get every home that we build to be net zero. And this is just kind of our process of how we do it. Great stuff. That's wonderful stuff. Thanks, Anthony. And thanks for clarifying that the healthy home component is heavily related to the HRV, because I think that's, it's not widely understood. But the HRV continually changes the air in the house all the time. So new construction takes out all the building gases and it brings you totally fresh air, which is actually really radical in the built environment. But well, well if, I can, if I can add something to your, to your point, you can upgrade filters, you know, the HEPA, HEPA filters and MERV filters. So you can act, they come with good filters, you can actually make them better. And when you talk about the, the off gassing of, of, of stuff in homes, because every home has that new home smell, right? Those are toxins, those are bad, those make people sick. So in built green homes, they're not allowed. We don't have anything that can off gas. It has to be no VOC paints and no added formaldehyde, no, no carpets that can off gas and, and cabinets and flooring. So none of those things come into any of our homes to begin with. So, you know, we're starting from a, a healthier standpoint on one because built green is a holistic approach to construction. It's not just about energy, which we're talking about today. So I think it's important. We're not having to filter out toxins because they don't exist in, in, a, in, in a really sustainable home. That is a great point. Well made. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Norm, really, just back to you, same question. I mean, if you can speak about, you know, some of the compelling technologies that TC builds with and how they might pay for their own costs. Um, you know, I mean, Anthony had an example about the, the fluid applied membrane that was a vapor barrier and it, you know, it's also the, the moisture barrier. I mean, TC Legend, I mean, what, do you, what is it that you're doing? Where's the cost benefits to, that other builders might be compelled to look at, you know? Right. Uh, well, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot of experience like actually comparing a, a, you know, a code minimum home to what we do. I know that, you know, from from the bottom uh, with our foundations, we, we've gotten um, competitive bids to form up uh, our stem walls and, and footings uh, from some local contractors. And the cost was, was exactly the same as, as our budget that included an ICF foundation. So it's, it, it's in the labor right there um, it, where, <clears throat> you know, the conventional foundation would cost a whole lot more and where and when we're done we have an insulated stem wall um, on top of the fact that you know I can pack 24 linear feet both sides of a uh, two foot tall stem wall on one shoulder so it, it goes up really fast and the the whole perimeter of your foundation is is really well insulated um, I can't say enough good stuff about the ICFs, I'll never go back to packing form boards. Um, mm -hmm. With the SIPS panels, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit gray because it incorporates all your insulation. Um, it, the, the entire envelope is just all kind of built in. All the chases for the electrical are already pre-installed, um, kind of carved out through the foam in the middle of the walls at outlet level and switch level. Um, so that, that's pretty convenient. Uh, our electricians love it. Um, and when you break it down, I mean, I've seen some stuff on the website uh, where we get our panels from um, that compare it. And, and they, they break it down to the point where, it, you know, it's, they've got a bunch of future cost savings kind of built into this equation. And, um, you know, it, it's believable. Uh, where it would come out to be on par with a conventionally, you know, stick frame two by six wall. When you're talking um, about, and then, if, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go I ahead. Was just say, you know, with the triple pane windows, 
I mean, the cost to upgrade is negligible um, as far as we've seen. And, um, and then we use a whole lot less lumber uh, all the way around. And I mean, we all know the cost of lumber is going up quickly. So, and then, you know, at the end of the day, we don't, we have a really inexpensive heating system in these houses because it just doesn't take much. Um, you know, we, and, and we're able to throw the money at different spots and, and options for our homeowners. Um, you know, the solar panels and, you know, these, the heat recovery systems and ventilators, all this stuff that just kind of increases the quality of life in the homes. So interesting. Okay. So you see a trade off, which makes sense now you to speak about it in the cost of the mechanical systems being lower whilst the cost of the envelope goes up. So there's a trade off there. So the money isn't, it's not necessarily an expense to build a more high performance shell because you get some of them or maybe all of the money back from the mechanical systems. Okay, um, let's do a little exercise. Let's just say, let's just do this exercise kind of fun. Um, okay, the world is cooking, climate change is on. You know, there's an announcement, climate change is gonna happen next week and you've absolutely got to change your buildings like now. So the question, and we'll stay with you Norman to begin with, is what is it, what's the first thing that you would do of all these technologies, which is the easiest to deploy? You know, you're under the pressure, you've got to make it happen. What are you going to do out of all the elements that you've discussed? Uh, if we're going to be building, um, you know, and we could only choose one, you know, we would, it would be that envelope, you know. I mean, it's got to be airtight and uh, just just to minimize any leakage of, of heat. I mean, that's where our biggest loads in our house go to. Okay, so, so you think that air, air sealing the envelope is the easiest win? For yeah, would you agree with that Anthony or is there something that you feel is is more compelling or easier to deploy hands down I would agree you stole my guess as well so I might guess my <laughs> answer but right behind that would be uh, upgrading your window package to a triple pane window so you know if, if there's a 1a this would be a 1b for me is, is yeah you know, yeah that's it any builder can can build an airtight house and you can upgrade the triple pane windows pretty easily it's not a huge Correct. cost difference so I think I think those two things would, would help get any home to be substantially more energy efficient. Okay, well the world's gone crazy. There's no air sealing technology available. You can't buy it. Everybody wants it, and there's no triple pane windows available. What do you do next? <laughs> I had a neighbor that used to go out when it was sub zero temperatures and spray his house with water so that it would freeze, <laughs> and he wouldn't have to use any kind of aero barrier, any of those things, and it. It sound a little bit like Alaska to me. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, the next thing are going to be your heat pumps. They are a, a fantastic, you know, way to heat. And, uh, you know, you just can't beat them. Um, you know, it's funny looking through the new energy codes about all these different heating systems. And I'm still scratching my head wondering why they're in there. They, they crossed off oil heating systems, but... You know, that was it. And I, I'm still kind of curious, you know, why they just don't make it the only option. For a heat pump. Yeah. Yeah, no, understood. Okay, so the heat pump is a compelling technology. I mean, I'm just going to run this list until we've exhausted all the, the easy options. And I guess what we're trying to do here is describe to builders who were maybe like a four-star built green builder how to like move to progress down the high performance road what what's the what are the easy technologies to adopt so heat pump i well, hear you know Anthony we'll, 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 we'll go all electric i mean getting rid of gas it's coming anyway the embodied energy of bringing gas to your site and the cost of, of, of gas um, really just isn't in the cards much longer so going all electric is going to save you a lot of money it's going to save you construction costs as well so you know induction cooktops you know uh you know, mini split heat pumps that, that, that's heating and cooling. Now we're, we're the, the climate's changing, right? So now we, we don't just open the windows around here in the Northwest for air conditioning. But, you know, now sometimes you gotta, you gotta cool your house down. And you know, that's the beautiful thing about mini splits and heat pumps is there's heating right. and cooling. And so your house can always sit just perfectly comfortable and balanced. And going all electric is the best way to, to offset it with solar anyway. So it's much top, tougher for solar to offset gas or, or fossil fuel. So, you know, we don't want those. They're not good for the environment and they're really not good to be in your house. So, you yeah. know, I think getting away from that, uh, we did it about 
six, six, seven years ago, we went all electric and we've never looked back. We've never had one person complain about not having gas in their house. Yeah, sounds great. I mean, let's, since the energy codes come up, let's just come back to the energy code because I mean, 2018 energy code, it just got delayed again. So it should be enforced sometime in the summer. But I mean, there are things in the energy code that, you know, are gonna look like they're beginning to be required. I mean, the HRV, for example, comes with your air leakage portfolio, you know, the energy credits. I mean, in the first case, just if anybody doesn't know, the energy credits required under 2018 energy code have gone up. Um, small house used to be credit and a half, now it's three. Medium house used to be four and a half, maybe, and now it's six. And a big house is now seven. Um, but, you know, for the category two energy credits, the air leakage out of the building is now coupled with the HRV. It's, I think it, my reading, which was pretty quick, says you've got to have the HRV as one in some of the higher value credits. So let's talk a bit about HRVs. What does it actually cost to put an HRV in? Who, who do you use? Who do you like? What does it cost? How does it work? Pitfalls, benefits, you know. Um, Norm, do you want to pick this one up first? And let's just have you dive in on heat. Uh, yeah, I mean... We're, we're pretty stuck on the Zender, which I, I know is kind of a, a higher level of uh, quality, but um, it's, we're all familiar with it now. It's, it's, it's easy for us to install and it, it does a fantastic job. One of those um, units that you install and you, you just don't have to ever worry about it again. And it, you kind of want that in an HRV because it is running 24 seven. So, um, I mean, we, we, we still install um, a, another HEPA filter in line with that, um, just for air quality, but um, sounds like Anthony has another model that you might be able to just- Well, just before you finish, Norm, just let me drag you back to cost, because cost is relevant. What do you charge to install an HRV, perhaps which model, you know, I understand it's a sender, but do you, do you know what you, what you charge? I think we buy um, the 3500, which is our mid-sized house model um, for about three, three grand. And then, you know, fully installed, which includes all the, the ventilation, um, you know, it's anywhere between seven and 10 grand right uh, for the entire system. But the, you know, the ducting is something that everybody's got to do anyway at this point. Right. So, you know, you can back that out of the equation. Um, but yeah, the unit is three grand. All right, Anthony, back, same back to you to speak on HRVs, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, yeah. So um, HRVs are the backbone of what we've been doing since 2008, when nobody even knew what an HRV was. So, you know, we, we've kind of jumped around to different brands. They're all, it's a pretty simple uh, mechanism to begin with. I mean, the Zender we put into some of our Uber, like, you know, award-winning kind of like premier homes that we really want to just push the envelope on. So we've done about a dozen of the vendors, but we, we go, the, the stepping down from that really isn't a big difference in performance that from a, from a modeling standpoint is probably maybe 20, 30% difference. Um, but the cost is, is, is for us, well, again, we're spec builders. We got to watch every, you know, every, every dollar that comes in is, is, is important that goes out. So, you know, we use the, the fan tech, we have a new hero series that is really, really, uh, been well received and put in the last few homes it has multiple filters inside that you can upgrade and change um and you know our hbac guys come in and, and just bang those things out it's standard ducting that, that goes up, up through it's every room and, and and pulls air out of bathrooms and brings fresh air into, into bedrooms i mean it wasn't that long ago where the seattle code required a four inch hole in every bedroom that stays right. open all the time that that connected yeah. to the outdoors because they think that if you shut your door, you won't get any fresh air and you have to have, so that those are, those holes are all gone now. <laughs> you don't have to do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So thank, thank goodness. It's hard to keep a tight envelope when you have to deal with that. But so from, from soup to nuts, all in, you know, it's anywhere from five to $7,000 to get, you know, a, a high quality balance. The key thing is you got to come back and balance these things. So we have our energy verifier. We use uh, Tadashi Shiga to everybody certified. He goes around, he sends his team out. He does our bill green verification, but he also does our, our balancing of, of the, uh, the HRVs to make sure that the right amount of CFMs are flowing and exhausting in each location. So just getting in is one thing, getting it balanced so it's actually being efficient is something else. 
Well, mm-hmm. and that's a valid point. Balancing, I mean, it's important to know that a you know a house that's heated by blowing hot air is pressurized, and that pressurized air leaks out of the holes. So if it yeah. is balanced and the house isn't positively pressurized, there's less imperative to leak, you you would think. Um, all right, so we got heat pumps. Um, let's perhaps talk a little bit about windows, um, which supplies you like, which you don't like, U values, R values, if you, you know. Uh, you want to go first this time? You, let's yeah. stay with you and then we'll run back to normal, right. yeah. Um, so uh, we've used, we've imported windows from, you know, from Portugal by Intis and super high performance, passive house glass, logistics, shipping them in. I mean, when, when, you, when you want the super high performance, it's really hard. They're really not available here in the U.S. There's some in Canada um, and they're really expensive. And so you got to have the right project or the right client in order to be able to get those into your homes effectively. So we, we chose to partner with, um, uh, used to be called Atrium Windows, but it's now, now they're called Prime. They're made right here in Washington State. Um, so we use Prime Windows and we also use Ply Gem Windows. And they do a really good triple pane window and it meets our budgets. But more importantly, it, it meets the, the values that we need to have for those windows in order to achieve our, our, our bill grade certification. Great stuff. Norma, who are TC Legend using for windows? Yeah, we have used the Ply Gems um, a handful of times as well. Uh, but then we also use probably a little more often now uh, the Vinyl Techs, and they are manufactured just across the border in BC. Um, we do like the Vinyl Techs. They do have some of those kind of fancier features where they, you know, they'll tilt in for, you know, just venting or fresh air. Um, you know, the doors, some of the French doors have four point locking system, they seal up really tight. Um, but, you know, it's just really all about getting triple panes. Um, you know, right. most, and, uh, sorry. I've got mill guards in my own house. I mean, even they make them. So. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, we'll just go around once more and then we'll get on to the meat of how to actually sell this stuff and how to get, you know, to pass the value on to your customers. But just before we finish up, um, just at heat pumps, who are you, who's TC Legend using for heat pumps just and, and why and any detail you can add that might be useful? Yeah, we, we will use our Fujitsu mini splits in smaller homes, um, you know, and they, you can have multiple heads with a lot of these uh, units. Um, in fact, I, we did a 4,000 square foot home with four heads, I believe, which was little challenging uh, with all the runs and the, the line sets get, you know, pretty complicated when you're running that many through the house. Um, they all have the condensate drains that need to make it out. But then for some of our homes that are insistent on, you know, the hydronic heating in the floors, uh, we'll use the Chiltrix and it is, it's a pretty nice system. Um, we're, we're finally getting to the point with the manufacturer where you know the first the first model had some major glitches and um, I've become a tech uh, as well as my partner Ted to fix all these um, but it, it does a lot it, it it'll heat your radiant floors it heats your domestic hot water it cools through a fan coil um, and then it'll also We've, we've installed this, uh, it's called a Comfo post, which is basically, I call it the, the air radiator, um, which hangs in line with your ventilation system. And it's basically just runs the same hot water through that as well. And got it. So it's been, it's been, been pretty, pretty, pretty good. We, we like them more and more every day. Fabulous. Okay. Same question for you, Anthony, um, heat pumps. So, uh, We've used the, 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 the chill tricks on a couple of projects, love it. Um, I'm not set up to, <laughs> to know how to navigate the mechanics of those things like TC Legend is. So, you know, unfortunately w- we've been like the, the, the test bunny on a lot of these products that come. Uh, so the chill tricks, we were one of the first guys along with you guys to, to start incorporating them and they're great. It's the service part of it and understanding how to really design the, the systems that, that become the challenge. We've also used the Sandin which is a CO2 heat pump, which was, uh, we were part of a, a, a test case with uh, Washington State University. And they brought a bunch of them into our homes. Those things are awesome as well. And the same, the same mind as, as the chill tracks. Um, but again, a complicated system with not a ton of support. There is more now for the sand in here locally. And, and we really, really like that. But, you know, 
I want to keep my, I'm a, I'm a spec builder. I keep going back to that. So callbacks and people, simple systems that are easy to fix and easy to get to and easy to maintain that are really efficient. So we use the Mitsubishi, uh, the, the heat pump uh, you know, system. It can, you can get up to five heads on, on one um, pump from outside. Um, you can actually program them now. Now you can't heat them and cool them at, at the same time. So they all have to be in the heat mode or a cool mode. But what you can do, they have an app that you can actually you can program the system. So upstairs, you can go in cool mode for, you know, between four and five o'clock, and then they will shut that off and put heat down in the basement, you know, right after that for 20 minutes. So you can, you can actually program the house. They can go in and out of heating and cooling, which that's what people want. They want the ability to adapt to their, to their home and their comfort level. So those are, those are pretty neat features as well, but we've done, we've done the dike in as well. So they're all comparable and they're all really, really efficient. And, um, and with the same for hot water. Heat pump water heaters are, are right in there with, with the heating and cooling systems that we have. So there's lots of different brands for, for heat pump water heaters, and that's what we put in our homes as well, and they, they add a whole other layer of efficiency. Well, throw some names out. Who, do, who are you using for heat pump hot water heaters? I know TC uses Ream. Um, yep. Yeah. Same with us. Same yeah, with really us. Standard. Okay. yeah, and there's Bradford, Bradford, I think Bradford White, I think that's the name of them. They, they have them. They're all now pretty good. GE had a, a product called Wellsprings, and, which was a really good, and then they discontinued it. <laughs> so I don't know why. We were buying a bunch of them. So, right. you know, they're all pretty comparable right now. It's just a matter of what size you need. And, um, you know, all you right. Know, yeah, go ahead. All, all good stuff. Well, I wanted to move on. We just were going to kind of try and close up a little bit with like this idea of like how to sell or how to like get your clients and sort of buy into, you know, this concept. But I just did want to clarify something for the audience before we move on that both TC Legend Homes and Dwell Development are design and build. And I think it's probably self-evident, but I just wanted to really clarify that because when you're making all these decisions, you can design them in. Whereas if you just get handed a set of plans and say, build this house, it's going to be a more of a struggle or, you know, or a struggle. So I just wanted to clarify that, but um, hi, Sonia. Hi, I just needed to step in. Um, we wanted to just have a clarification real quick. Governor Inslee actually reverted back the energy code. So it will be implemented February 1st. That was used as of like two hours ago. So, oh, wow. <laughs> but just for the rest of the, the webinar participants, um, it will be in effect February 1st. Breaking news. You heard it here first. Wow. Good stuff. All right. Thank you. Here we go. Um, Your orders in on the HRVs. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, our last point was really, um, you know, these elements cost money and, it, you know, is, is, is really how to sell the benefits of some of these high performance features to your clients in the design process or as a, or how they sell them further down the line. And the HRV is a really pretty easy example to speak to because you get this incredible air quality uh, and people relate to it and then there's smoke. But some of the some of the elements are more difficult to sell. I mean, I mean, how do you, I mean, what do we do? I mean, how how do you how do you work it, Anthony? I mean you ask me that. That's yeah, it's a very vague question. Yeah. I'm well, running no, out no, of no. It, it's the core of what what you know I find my job at, as well as I'm kind of the brand manager and, and, and I, I qualify our buyers. And so we pre-sell right. a lot of our homes and a lot of people want to come buy one of our homes because they're cool and they, they've heard about dwell and they're energy efficient. But if we don't have the right education in that buyer's mind, but I don't want someone to buy our house because it's a cool house and they can write a check. That doesn't fulfill me as a, as a builder because what we build is really, really special. I mean, dwell and TC legend homes build the most energy efficient sustainable homes in the world right now. I mean, we are on par with, with, everybody that's out there that that's efficient so i qualify my buyers i give them a, a new buyer you know sit down with them and i and i actually give them a class and if i don't feel that they, that they are going to embrace it and appreciate the value of, of the systems and, and be a part of this bigger global issue that we all have then, then we won't proceed and so yeah. you know i don't want to sound like i'm egotistical but you know it has to be a good marriage and that comes through education it comes through training our buyers and training our brokers our, our mortgage lenders, everybody's got to understand that what they're getting isn't just the standard home. But it it's sounds to me like you, you you have a queue of people down the street who want to build it, buy your houses. Now, perhaps maybe let's say for let's say that queue is all gone, and now there's, I mean, and now you've actually got to sell. And I guess the question is, um, you know, we're asking people to pay more for a house, and it's it's pretty logical when you think about it. This is a highly insulated house. 
it's going to have lower running costs um, and you know the total cost of ownership you know if you live in this house for 30 years your energy bills are going to be so much less and I mean, I know when you apply for a Department of Energy award, they actually do the math for you. Your HERS rater will do the math and it will tell you that your energy savings over 30 years will be $60,000. I mean, um, do you use those? Do you have a way of calculating the energy Absolutely. saving? And do you we turn that into dollar bills for your clients as well? Can you turn yeah, the energy? Yeah, yeah. We, we, used, we used to do like a food label, like on our, on our front door. And, and we can talk oh, wow. about this not right now, but we used to do a little food label because people understand how to read the food label. And, this is a dwell built home and this is a code built home. And here's what your energy cost is compared to a code home and dwell home. And you gotta make it tangible and intangible differences because a lot of things people are just gonna benefit from because they're living in a healthy home. They're not gonna know what's going on behind the walls. And you also gotta show them where it hits them in the pocketbook, where they're gonna save money, a lot of money uh, by living in a high performance net zero energy ready home. And you know, it starts with these utility bills. I mean, this is a slide that that uh, uh, I'm working with Sam Rashkin from the Department of Energy on, and we're doing a presentation at the IBS show in, next month. And this is one of the slides that we, we got, because this, is, this really shows the, the, the builder and the buyer of, of, of the impact. So what this is showing, and we, we all talk to this, so I'll take the first one, utility bills, you know, the 30 year cost benefit. And this is like, just pick one of the things that were on, you know, um, you know TC Legends list or Dwell's list. You know, a three or five thousand dollar investment. This is what it can turn into for your utility bills. Over thirty years, you can save up to forty five thousand dollars in uh, utility bills. The average base net zero energy ready home. This is net zero energy ready. This isn't with even with solar on it. You know, you know, projects thirty years ranging from twenty five to sixty five thousand dollars. So that's tangible. That's money in your pocket that you can put for your kids' college fund or put it in as an investment in, in a stock somewhere and actually make. You know, a return on. So this is this is real money. This isn't just chump change. You know, it'd be really interesting to see that fruit label and actually just almost if you had any way of sharing the math and how you actually calculate it. You know, let's say we're now going to build an R thirty wall that we used to build an R twenty one wall. How much energy does that save? How do we turn that in those terms into dollars so that a guy who's trying to make the leap can actually just do the math and say, hey, guy, I'm going to build your house, but we're going to do an R30 wall. It's going to save you $12,000 over five years, and it's going to cost you three grand. Do you want to do it? Yes or no. Um, yeah. So, But if there's any way for you to share that out in the future, or Bill Green could disseminate that process, I think that would actually have real utility. But let's move down the list. Health expenses. Norm, do you want to have a swing at health expenses? You know, HRV, air quality, smoke, forest fires, those kinds of things? Uh, sure. I mean... We all know after the past couple summers how bad the smoke was here in the Northwest. Uh, my wife and I actually had to wear masks while we slept in a hotel room uh, on our way across the state last summer. I mean, it's, it's, it's getting bad and it, it's getting worse. Um, I mean, one trip to the doctor, one, one case of asthma. And I mean, it's a, right. you know, it's a, thousand dollar unit that you install in your house that from the beginning um you, you, uh, honestly just for the the sake of comfort alone and not having to you know deal with the smoke in the summers that you know it's it's worth it yeah so that's it and, and you know it's occurred to me that i mean you know you want to go to the gym in the in the burn you want to go to a gym for example or somewhere you want to go and hang out at someone's house that's got clean air clean air is going to become a thing that people differentiate their location around certainly um, going forward and it didn't burn this summer um let's roll down maintenance um yeah and I'll, i know we want to get to uh questions from from the guests here so i'll, I'll just finish this out if you guys are okay with yeah, that blast through it, it. You know, the durable products that go into homes that we build you know you're going to save thirty thousand dollars over 30 years just in not having to deal with crappy materials that aren't durable and and, and then you then the value added you know um you know we love to think that our homes are more valuable than other homes because of what we put into them. Uh, a lot of times people don't see that, but this is the, the real breaking point. And, and I'll close with this before we go to questions is, is that I always share this example. You know, 2009, I built a 1500 square foot house in Columbia City in a community called uh, Rainer Vista. And it was the first phase of doing it. We did like 45 homes in there. And I pre-sold the Holman Foundation. It was $400,000, uh, zero days on the market, three bedrooms, two baths. And another builder in the same community, right down the street, same block, built a beautiful home, kind of modern, 
uh, very reputable builder. He was on the market, same size house. He was in the market for 175 days and sold his house for $100,000 less. Wow. And it was a great home. I don't understand why was it our design? Was it our, our, our sustainability? It was a combination of all those things. But to answer this question, the value added, people are willing to pay for it because they feel they're getting more value, not just from the health of the home, but from the tangible savings and utility bills and so forth too. So, you know, I think that's really, really important to add in there. Well, and it should become the new standard. It should, you know, standard. Yep. Great stuff. All right. Well, thanks, gents. I think we're going to questions. Yes. So um, just so every attendee is aware, um, we did allow for some extra time for Q&A. So if you are available, we will be answering um, most of the questions we have here. We have about 11. Um, so please stick around if you're curious. Otherwise, we will be recording and you can follow up with the Q&A session if you need to move on to a different part of your day. Um, but we will be continuing until about 3.30 today um, in case you want to stick around. So the first question, um, jumping back to, let's see. So uh, basic question that somebody would like answered uh, first at the top of the, the session was, um, what is the requirement for installation R value with the new code? Great question. Um, I, and I know it depends on if you're talking about walls, roof or anything <laughs> else. <laughs> I would no, just I thought it was the same. It's still an R21 in the walls, or maybe that's, you know, maybe, is that the bumped up um, new code? Because oh, I gotta be R21 honest. with R, yeah, but I don't, I don't pay attention to minimum code. I, I mean, it's, I don't it's even know what the code is. Not really like enters our radar anymore. Therein lies the problem. I'm looking at the code. I mean, the credits you got. Doesn't that speak to your guys's um, design and, and practices, making it so that the code really doesn't affect you as much anymore? I mean, there's going to be details here and there, but that seems like it might be a benefit. Absolutely, we're building homes that are that are going to meet the code in 20 years from now. And we've been building that way for a long time. So, you know, to answer your question, yeah, we don't even. I mean, the bare minimum is, you know, down there. We, we build them the way we build them. And uh, if someone asked me what the code is for the, a wall, I'm like, I don't know. We built, we built double two or three walls and pack it full of insulation. <laughs> so it's like double. The minimum you can get a credit for is an R21 wall. It looks like it's plus R4 of rigid foam on the outside. So like two inches of rigid foam on the board on the outside. But that's the minimum you can get a credit for. Um, mm -hmm. But like the gents have said, because these guys are neither of them building, they're building enormously high performance houses. Unfortunately, uh, two, uh, yeah, we don't know. <laughs> I'm embarrassing. Sorry. Well, the, the key point I think to take away is that if you're following what these guys are doing and, and doing the same sort of things, you don't need, you'll, you'll definitely meet code and not have to worry about it. Yeah. Um, all right. So we had a couple of questions regarding HRVs. Um, so are there other options like ERVs and can you discuss, do you guys use them at all? Um, and then another related to retrofitting existing homes with HRVs and if you have any idea of what that looks like or cost. Um, and I'll follow up after those two questions with another HRV question just to Boy, um, Anthony, you might have some more information about this, but uh, retrofitting a home with an HRV could get pretty challenging with with the infrastructure of ducting that needs to be in there from the from the get go. I mean, it needs to be you know balanced, and it's it's you're you're tearing apart walls to make that happen because you're sucking. Yeah from you know moist areas in the house like your bathrooms and your laundry room and then you're pumping back into you know bedrooms and living spaces so unless you like exposed spiral ducts in which case it could look fabulous <laughs> well it's a, it could it's a mod, if it's you know if it's a modern aesthetic you could just look at it in which case it would be easier or yeah unless, unless you're doing like a you know a, a gut remodel type of job where you can get to the, the wall cavities and run your ductwork i think an hrv would be really challenging to do with that in a remodel. Um, as far as 
um, heat recovery ventilators and, and ERVs, energy recovery ventilators. You know, my understanding, I've done an ERV once and really our climate here in the Northwest, you know, the marine climate is very temperate. You don't have super hot days and super cool days. The HRV is more modeled, modeled for, for, for this climate zone compared to like an ERV in Minnesota would probably be more appropriate, uh, you know, in these extreme climates. So, you know, they basically are doing the same thing. There's some nuances to an ERV that I, I don't know because I don't use it, but my understanding is that they're really based, I don't know if, if, if Jake, you can, you can speak to that. Well, I think there's room for confusion here because those little single room units used to be called ERVs and they maybe still are, you know, where you just plug them into one room and it does a single room. That was also called an ERV when I looked at them a couple of years ago. So that may be source for confusion, but just to clarify, an HRV leaves the moisture in the heating air and an ERV spins it out. So one is for use in a dry climate and one's for use in a wet climate. Um, yeah. we, we really don't go ahead. Oh, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I apologize. I just wanted to, I just thought of something in regards to remodeling. They have little spot HRVs that you can buy now that are literally, you mount right. in the ceiling, you can duck them straight out. So if you have a small mm -hmm. space and you don't have room to get ducting everywhere, they have spot HRVs and ERVs that, you, that look like, you know, they look like a, a, a flush mounted wall fit in, in, into the ceiling panel and you can actually use a, an HRV that way. So that, that would might, be the way to do a remodel, yeah. That might be super cool in like your bedroom or your living room. You just choose the rooms you need to ventilate and get power to it and drill your hole in the wall. And that, that yeah. may be the way to go. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. True. What else? I think so we another question. HRV question was in relations to if you have a smaller home. So we've been your traditional kind of typical building that you guys were pricing out and discussing earlier is around 2,500 square feet. But let's say you're building a smaller home with no attached garage, no utility room, where would the HRV equipment go? So your think, townhouse. <laughs> it's a lot like the, um, the unit that Anthony was just mentioning. Um, you know, we, we did do a tiny house or it was a tiny office at the time. And um, we installed one of those, you know, single units that, you know, it had two vents going out the wall and it was, it was recovering the heat, um, you know, by itself, it just kind of it as a standalone little miniature system. And that was an overhead yeah. unit mounted on the ceiling, but we've also put a, a Zender 200 in a closet space. They'll fit in a closet space. Um, and that's okay. The thing to note that's important is that the bigger the unit, the more air it can move. So people say small house, but if you've got lots of friends that come over and, and they are all breathing, uh, you're going to want to move a lot more air. And it, it, it's kind of relevant. And the, the good HRVs come with a CO2 detector. So if that detects lots of HR, CO2, it knows there's lots of people in there and it ramps the fan up. Um, I would say you, a lot of the HRVs that TC Legend fits are fitted high up towards the ceiling and you could kind of almost maybe put them above the bench if people sit down, set their boots on and off. You know, it could fit in an entryway with a little bit of ingenuity. Maybe, maybe in the stair space, if you've got you know, that top triangle above the stairs where you don't need the overhead space, that potentially. Yeah, I've done some small townhouses and you know, we, 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 we didn't have the space to get the HRV in that we thought we had. So we've done them in, in the tops of closets. You, know, you hang your shelf and clothes underneath them. As long as you have access to them, we've done them under these stairs. And that usually gives you the opportunity to get ducking up, uh, like we already mentioned. So they don't, they're not that big. I mean, you can get an HRV, you know, like a, a 200 or 250 is, is the size of probably a microwave you know, a large microwave. So you can imagine getting a microwave somewhere kind of mounted to the wall and you can, you can get your ducks out to it. Excuse me. But they are completely the most, they're, they're, I think they're the best thing that's happened in building science for a long time. I think HIVs are the bomb because the fresh air quality, I, I sell them to people like this. I explained that fresh air feeling you get when you open the door, you've been indoors, you open the door, you walk outside and you go ping and you wake up because you've got that fresh air. That's how you feel inside a house when you're running an HRV. And the other thing we've noticed is that people whose houses we've designed where we fit HRVs, we don't fit nearly as many opening windows because they don't open them. Nobody with an HRV, a good solid HRV running ever opens the windows. 
So we don't fit them. And if since an opening window is twice the cost of a fixed window, you can cover a lot of your HRV cost based on the fact that people just don't open the windows because the air quality is stellar inside. Um, you know. Yeah, and ninety percent efficiency is is impressive. You know, it's capturing ninety percent of the heat out of the outgoing air. I don't know. I I don't know the exact mechanics of it, but it's impressive. Norm, I have a question for you. Maybe Jake can chip in. Um, are SIPs an option when fire rated walls are required? Uh, yeah, actually. Um, well, we've, we've done some additional techniques to fire rate certain walls in our houses, but um, there are some, you know, like the, there's a new foam that we're using that has a kind of a graphite base to it. And not only does it um, have a higher R value, but than the regular old white uh, polystyrene, but it also has some fire retardants in it as well. So the, um, the SIPs, all the SIPs come with a design, um, like a factory test, a panel test, and there is a fire code section on it for basically how to layer up the sheetrock and how to screw it. So yes, you can build a rated firewall I mean, half an hour, definitely, probably an hour. I don't know if there's a one, hour, if there's a two hour, but there's definitely, there's a standard detail that's stamped and approved and the fire department will okay it. Right. Um, so getting back to the windows, so you guys had covered the windows. Um, somebody asked, you still need egress windows from bedrooms and it's nice to be able to wash windows from inside of the house. <laughs> I guess that's more of a comment than a question. Um, I, I do like this question because this comes up a lot about why a lot of homes don't get to 100% electricity. Um, if they do go all electric, what fireplace replacement options okay. have you guys used or are familiar with? What, what uh, we, 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 we don't put them in. <laughs> We okay. don't put them in. We started, uh, I built a, a couple of five-star Bill Green homes and just before we went all electric and I put a gas fireplace in because you have to market the home, right? Well, the home was so efficient that the little pilot light that you leave on in the gas fireplace would overheat the house and the in-floor radiant heat wouldn't kick on and it just wasn't comfortable. So I, I, I told them to turn off the <laughs> pilot light because you, I mean, the only time people put those things on are for ambiance. And so there's electric versions that you can buy that kind of cheesy looking. So we just, we just own it. We say, look, most people don't use fireplaces. They are a horrible, and even if you have a natural fireplace or a gas fireplace, they're just not good. <laughs> they're, they're not good for the environment. They're not good for heat loss and energy consumption. So, you know, fossil fuel. So we just designed them completely out of our homes and we don't have anybody push back. We just sold a really beautiful home in Wallingford for a really big price and there's no fireplace in it. And they said, good, because we don't like fireplaces. So I hope that answers that question. We use the, um, like the fake fireplaces, you know, the ones that are basically, a, they're like a pair of tights with a light and a fan. Um, and they've got an electric, tiny little electric fan. So it can look like a fireplace and it can be on or it can look like a fireplace and be off but it's basically an electric great you know an electric um an element filament thing but and they kind of make people happy because the mind is easily fooled uh we put one in the the Worrell house if you remember norm um and they do sit around it you know yeah they do we we put a gas fireplace in one of our homes it was a deal breaker um this was about two years ago and so we put it in and I went over there to, I don't know, give them a tutorial on something else, but it was about 87 degrees in their house. And, and you know, it's like all the windows are open and, and they've got this fireplace cooking away. But yeah, you just, you overheat. And that's what we found out. So, I mean, if you really need a fireplace, maybe put it on the patio. Or, well, just a fake one that just looks like a fireplace because the house doesn't need the heat. I mean, people come to us often and say, hey, we want to put a wood burning stove in it. And we're just like, you're going to have it on for like four minutes and then your house is going to be cooking. And then you're going to have to open all the doors and windows because it's going to spew out like 70,000 BTUs per hour. And your house, it, 
your the heat load for a TC Legend house is like twelve and a half thousand is about average, you know. Like these houses are so well insulated they can't cope with being heated in that in that way. That's a mind shift. It's 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 it's, it's just a, a shift in, in what consumers used to want in their homes and what builders wanted to give them. Now we're talking about rough in for solar readiness, smart home technology. So it's just, you know, you know, having that extra office or place for your kids to do schoolwork. So now we're, we're shifting now, uh, you know, the, the dialogue and the, the needs and wants of buyers. And, you know, yeah, if someone wants a fireplace, like, like uh, you know, Norm said, outdoor living is great. Get that fire pit outside and go for it, you know. Or a 4K TV with a really good video of a fireplace. I mean, yeah. the, mind, the mind is pretty easily fooled, isn't it? Um, how is the fluid applied waterproof barrier applied and do you need to seal off from the neighbors? So this is more of a technical application. Question. Right. Just think about um, painters coming to your house to roll on paint on the outside. It's, it's literally, they take their pump jacks, they go around the exterior of the house. It takes them about a, you know, they're not detailed like a painter. They're just rolling it on and putting uh, mesh on the seams and adding little flaps on the windows. It takes about um, a good, a good two days to, to do a you know 2,500 square foot house. So um, you'd have to take the same precautions if you're really close to a neighbor as you would if you were spraying. But you're not spraying paint, so it's not going to get particles anywhere. It's just just a roll-on product. So you know, really, we've never had any issues with it outside of it just dripping on the ground and they got to clean it up. Hey, Anthony, I have a question about that. Um, do you guys put it on the roof as well? No, no, uh, it, no it doesn't. Uh, it's not um, the the, the, the products like a TPO roof or uh, the insulation isn't rated to go against the, the uh, Enviro Dry. So they don't want those products touching and being in contact. Gotcha. You know, it's just one of those things. And there's really no need for it up there anyway. But in your application, it might make sense. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. The SIPs. Mm -hmm. And uh, water heating and heat pump water heaters, you mentioned a couple. Could you sort of discuss, um, is there a way to combine your heat pumps or is it you guys typically use separate heat pumps for different applications and then maybe touch on, just retouch on what those water heater, the heat pump water heaters you use were? Um, yeah, so we, we, we steer away from you know, having two exterior heat pumps on a house, it's, it's, it's a little bit of overkill. Um, when we're trying to achieve domestic hot water and heating a home, we'll use the chill tricks. Um, we're, we also have the option then to cool uh, in the summertime with, with the chill tricks. Uh, it, when we go with us, when we're building smaller homes and we're doing a domestic hot water system and a mini split, then we will use the heat pump water heater, which just has the heat pump, you know, mounted on the, on the top of it. And we've experimented a little bit with like ducting that exhausted cool air out because it's, you know, when it's in your conditioned space, it's sucking up your you know, your warm air, harvesting the heat out of it and then pumping cold air out. So, you know, you don't want that cold air being reintroduced into the house. So we've, we have tried to pipe that out or give an option to use it in the summertime when you're heating hot water and then you can use it as kind of an AC for the inside of your house. And yeah, we, we use that. We use the same system. I mean, uh, we've done the chill tracks, but um, we, we can't we can't afford to do that in all our homes. <laughs> so, so we do the mini splits and the heat pump water heaters in separate units. And, and the heat pump water heaters they are substantially more efficient when you vent them, per uh, Norm's suggestion, because it, it, it's cool air coming out of those things. Um, but you can capture it. Like we designed a house where you can actually um, export that cool air into a, a wine room next door if you want to keep you know your wine room tempered with just a little you know, a little flapper valve, and then it goes outside 90% of the time, you want to, you know, cool a room or a space, you can open it up, but they, they really do need to be vented uh, outside. But if you want to maximize the efficiency of the unit, you can make them non-vented, but then you're dealing with the cooling aspects of them. Okay. Have you, have you had a condensation problem on the cool vent line? Have you had to insulate the cool vent line because they're condensating inside the houses? Oh, you gotta, you got you gotta definitely wrap those things for sure. Yeah. Right. Insulate, insulate the them well yeah 
Yeah. All right. So the big questions that have been uh, hanging out here, we're getting to solar panels. Um, we had a couple long kind of questions. So I'm going to bear with me as I sort of paraphrase. Um, there was a comment about how Western Washington has a really poor solar radiation index um, compared to other regions. And, you know, there is a cost as far as the solar panel production um, and the waste disposal problem of solar panels of there not being any sort of recycling strategy currently. Um, and then also the, the cost of the solar energy is higher than if you did like a PSE utility green power program where you just paid a little bit more on your utility bill to purchase from utility renewable level energy. Um, so they kind of asked like, what is the environmental kind of ethical standpoint to install solar panels on your projects? Why do you guys do them? Should we just pass this around? I'm happy to jump in first. Um, let's just go through it. So the worst solar radiation, I, I think Washington has three and a half daylight hours and it's just averaged out. Um, so sure, it's going to be pretty bad because there's cloud, but it's enough to drive a net zero house. So it's definitely mechanically okay to do it. Um, the cost of solar power through the panel versus power from the subsidies. I'm not aware of the details. I'm aware we had a client last year turn around and say, we don't want to put solar on the roof because the math doesn't pencil out. And I looked at the math and it was about a wash, you know, but you've got some energy independence. And critically, from my point of view, um, you are getting behind a technology that needs to grow. I mean, there's there is enough solar there's enough sunshine in the state to make it work and adopting technologies that that have potential is an ethically responsible thing to do get behind solar the costs are coming down and the costs on solar panels are dropping daily so it's always worth checking in on the math regularly to see where the cost is at so ethically ethically get behind it because it's got to get behind you know we've got to get behind it somehow there aren't that many other avenues for creating power that's basically free you know, as in solar. So that's how I would speak to that. The recycling program, I don't know about, and the carbon footprint of the panel itself, the embedded energy in the panel, I'm aware it exists. Um, I don't know what the math is, um, but that's probably my piece, which is it's viable to drive your house net metered from solar, so do it. Um, I understand that some of, the, some of the math is a wash and some of the embedded, the energy stuff is a wash. But it's got to happen in order to bring the world back from the edge of like a climate catastrophe. Solar needs to be endorsed. I mean, look at Germany. Germany has an unbelievably huge solar deployment. Um, and so stuff is moving. And I'm just going to stand behind the Germans and say, well, if the Germans are doing it, then it can't be all bad. Um, yeah, I'll jump in on that. I mean, what's the one country in the world that does more solar than anybody? It's just Germany. And they have weather very similar here in Seattle, if not even more cloudy. So, um, you know, for me, I think it's, it's more ethical to do it than it is not to do it. You know, you, you, can, you can create a dialogue and a narrative about the embodied energy of these systems, but the fact that you are producing an, an on-site renewable energy that can run your home and your life and the rest goes out to the grid and then there's incentives for you to do that, uh, it's, it, it's a no-brainer. I mean, it, it, it's going to be code here sooner now for following California you know, their, their net energy, we're going to, it's going to be a matter of time when we're doing one of these classes and we're not just talking about, you know, toilet paint windows and HRVs. We're talking about, you guys have to get to net zero. You know, it's coming and, and, the, and the climate needs it and, and our building community needs this to happen. So, um, but when you're talking about just incentives for it, I mean, the federal government steps in and I think it is renewed. I think it is inked it where it got extended again. I think it's 20, 26% of the initial cost is automatically given back to the homeowner. I mean, I can buy a solar package and put it on one of my homes, but that homeowner gets that in tax write-off year one. So if I put in a, a $30,000 solar package, they get a 10,000 or close to a $10,000 write-off on their taxes year one. That goes straight to the homeowner. 
then they get all that free energy for the rest of the life that, that's going through the house. They're using that energy. It's going back, back to the grid. And there's going to be times where you're going to be getting credits every month from your utility provider. And there's going to be times where you're going to be paying into it. But the, the point is, as it balances out from the dark days and the sunny days, at the end, you want to be at net zero. That's really what we're, we're all trying to accomplish. And, and who, it, who doesn't win there? Everybody wins, right? Right. And the elephant in the room to do with certainly the houses that TC Legend builds and, and indeed you as well, Anthony, is, is net, net metering. And that's a discussion that it's not getting enough discussion because net metering is the, is the practice by which we make solar and then we push it out to the grid um, when we make too much of it. And then we draw on the grid when we need it. So you don't have to make your solar when you need it. So you need energy in the winter, but there's no sunshine. A net metered house makes most of its power in the summer when it doesn't need it. And that arrangement is met with net metering. But the net metering agreements that's legislated isn't going to stay open forever. And then there's and so that's an area that really needs like much more widespread discourse um, in terms of how to keep the net metering agreement open. You know, so the grid can be balanced and so all these solar arrays can continue to function and we can continue to build, you know, solar equipped houses. Yeah, these should be small businesses that every every house that can that can put solar panels on it could be in theory could be its own little business generating you know free energy and putting it back to the grid and and the utility should be paying for that that's free energy going back to their grid system that they're then selling to somebody else that doesn't have it so you know I to, to your point Jake I mean it, it, we have to have a change in, in that whole dialogue with uh, utility providers because they're struggling to upkeep their systems I get it we have a lot of hydropower around here I get it. We have really cheap energy rates compared to the, anywhere else in the country. We're, we're at the bottom. So we're very fortunate where we live that we have low energy rates. We have peak rates. We're pretty flat. Um, but to, to your point, we, we, have, we have to create a, an incentive for the home, every home buyer to put solar on the roof because all that energy is, is coming down on us anyway. You might as well capture it and use it. Yeah, I'll, I'll say one little part there um, about the the program with PSE uh, where you can purchase credits towards, you know, solar energy or green energy. Um, you know, that, that's a great program. If you live, you know, in the middle of the woods or the only, you know, part of your house that could, or roof that could possibly generate power, you know, happens to be on the North side of the house and it's not going to do anything for you by all means, you know, buy into it it's you know it is a it is a good program but make no mistake they have huge solar panel fields on the east side of the state that are doing the generation and then the recycling program quite honestly i don't know a solar panel that has quit working ever you know i mean they just keep going and going and going i mean 30 years 50 year panels are still they do their efficiency drops off doesn't it they become they become less efficient as the glass gets scratched up i think and just weather sure but they still but they still work yeah they still chug along yeah and they paid for themselves you know at year what 10 15 oh, maybe oh sooner than that i mean we we run our models for our homeowners that put them on and with that tax credit you're getting almost a third back you're getting up to you know five thousand dollars used to get a tax credit back i mean not tax credit a energy credit back from the utility provider up to five thousand dollars a year so i mean now it's even i mean we, we predict five to six years that people can get their their uh, return on their investment yeah amazing your homes are probably faster than that i would guess well, last question, I want to thank all our panelists for sticking around, especially our 31 attendees who are still here. Um, super excited. We had 40 people register today. So that's great. Um, last question, how do you seal the ceiling between the top floor and the roof, particularly with angled roofs? Well, in a, in a SIPs building, there isn't a ceiling because it's, yeah. it's vaulted. Because so, you can... Uh, so that question is probably for me, right? So um, th that, that is our non-vented roof system that we already talked about. So on the, on the inside of, of, you know, on the inside of the building, you are literally packing the joists or the trusses with blown in cellulose insulation and netting that in there so it stays in place. It's packed up against the, 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 the roof, the bottom side of the roof, packed tight. You know, 
the oil is probably almost pillowing out a little bit, not too much. And then on top of that, you, you can do your rigid, we do our rigid insulation and then our hardboard and whatever material you want to put up on your roofing. So, you know, it gives that great insulated, you know, thermal efficiency that, you know, you don't ever have to worry about moisture or air getting in there. That's what creates the issues. So you want it tack tight and uh, but that's how we do it. Great. Well, I want to um, thank everyone again and just um, let everyone know on the webinar that if you would like a handout that summarizes all the brands and kind of costs and, and things that we discussed today, um, you may email builtgreen at mbax.com um, and we will send you that. We will also be sending all registered attendees a recording of this, um, regardless of if you email us or not. Um, for you to play back as needed, um, but feel free to email us and respond to the survey as well that you'll be getting after this event. Thank you, uh, Jake, Norm, and Anthony for your time today, and thank you all for attending. Have a good right, week. Matt, thank can you, I add one thing too? Sure. I know we talked about this in our practice session. Um, anybody that wants to talk to me about how to build high performance uh, energy efficient homes, uh, uh, I'm open to have one-on-ones, phone conversations, Zoom conversations. I want everyone to build the, the home these ways. So, so I, I know my contact information can be given out through the Master Builders uh, website as well, but I want to make sure everybody knew that. This is, I'm not competitive with other builders. I want to support other builders in, in, in building homes like this. Agreed. Yep. More than happy. Share any trade secrets. <laughs> I think you just gave them all away anyway, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, I don't think we can. We need to find a different word for trade secrets if they're not going to be secrets anymore. They're not really secrets anymore. <laughs> yep. It's called the source. Right. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, guys.